Martín Vicente, varias veces, bueno, estos son del mismo evento, Alberto contándonos sus cosas. Eh, también en IBM nos dejaron su, un auditorio fantástico que tienen allí. Gracias, Juan, por dejarte liar, <risa> que la verdad le liamos bastante bien, pero, pero estuvo, estuvo genial. Aquel evento donde Raúl nos contó cosas sobre, sobre Sublime, o sea que, que no hablamos solo de lenguaje, también hablamos de herramientas. ¿Qué más hemos tenido por ahí? Diego contándonos cosas de, del auto, el Almost Always Use Auto. Martín hablándonos de cómo hacer librerías que otros puedan usar. También José Daniel, como no, contándonos sus peripecias allá en de los mares. Eh, hicimos eventos en LifeRay, donde José Miguel de Market Goo nos, nos expuso alguno, algunas tripas de, de su propia empresa, se lo agradecemos mucho. Mateo, que nos, nos hizo ahí una en vivo, nos anduvo contando cosas de, de sistemas embebidos, ahí con, con mucho valor, porque poner una plaquita de esas, cargar un programa y correrlo, supongo que, que a veces da, da miedo. Dani nos estuvo hablando de, de temas de DevOps, así que esto no es más que, que una muestra que... Para deciros que aunque, no pense, aunque penséis que no sabéis lo último del lenguaje, no pasa nada, se puede hablar de otras cosas. E incluso de vuestra experiencia en el aprendizaje, vuestro, cómo os habéis aproximado a cierta funcionalidad, a lo que sea. Porque el siguiente, el siguiente evento que queremos organizar, indudablemente, tiene que ser con uno de vosotros. O sea, aquí está el próximo ponente. Animaos comentádnoslo si queréis, preparaos algo, os podemos echar una mano tanto en el tema como luego, por supuesto, en toda la logística, pero si no sale de vosotros, nosotros intentamos tirar de cierta gente, pero, pero bueno, a veces no somos tan buenos animando a las personas. Y por ir entrando ya más en harina, el Meetup de hoy, como es especial, creo que es importante mostrar que que hay varias empresas que desde siempre han estado apoyando esta comunidad, cediéndonos su espacio y también, por qué no decirlo, de, de manera económica, pagando las pizzas y las cervezas que, que hemos tenido en eventos pasados y que hoy vamos a tener al final. Uno de ellos es, es Indicen, que quienes hayáis venido al Meetup alguna vez seguro que habéis estado en sus oficinas, como sabéis, es una empresa que hace consultoría, pero también tiene algo de producto en las partes de sanidad, de finanzas, tiene gente en los, en los principales bancos. Y ahora diría que, que han abierto una oficina en Málaga, que no, le, joder, que no nos dicen que lo comentemos, pero la han abierto en Málaga, así que a lo mejor se puede hacer C++ en Málaga de la mano de una empresa de Madrid. Pensadlo. También patrocina hoy JFrog, Conan, que bueno, que habréis visto que algunos llevamos alguna camiseta de, del Frogarian. Conan es un gestor de paquetes de código abierto, gratuito, que funciona en todas las plataformas y que soporta prácticamente todos los build systems y si no, los, los estamos añadiendo. Aquí cambio a primera persona porque bueno, somos, soy parte de Conan. Deciros que, por supuesto, JFrog está creciendo exponencialmente, Conan también está creciendo, está teniendo mucha atracción entre las empresas, estamos contratando, podemos hablar luego. No solo de camisetas, que si queréis una camiseta... Bueno, no hemos traído, pero... Pero... Mira, yo me comprometo. Si, si me tuiteáis algo ahí con lo de Conan y tal, yo, yo trato de encontraros luego y os, y os intento, vamos, y quedamos un día y os regalo una camiseta, ¿vale? Así que eso, bueno, creo que tenemos, ¿no? Venga, ¿vale? <risa> luego, Market Goo también nos patrocina hoy, que como decía José Miguel, hizo una charla en LifeRay y es una empresa que hace analítica web, temas de SEO, de posicionamiento que bueno, debe estar creciendo también brutalmente porque son poquitos 
en esta foto, que son los retiros que hacen anualmente, que se van por ahí a unos lugares idílicos a no hacer nada, deben estar casi todos, no sé, y han contratado a otras cuatro personas, así que, que ojo, eso también está, está corriendo. Y cerrando, y también queríamos incorporar para mostrar el apoyo de Codemotion a este Meetup, que como sabéis es una organización que anda detrás de la organización de una, de una conferencia de donde se incorporan muchas comunidades y que este, el próximo mes, en febrero, vamos a empezar, vamos, somos parte, a mí me han citado, y vamos a empezar a organizar esta conferencia a ver cuándo tiene, tiene lugar este año y eso. Y poco más, deciros que las presentaciones las subimos en esta página web, que es un GitHub Pages, en un, vamos, o sea, que parte de un repositorio de GitHub, que podéis clonaros, con, contribuir a él y si no acceder directamente a través de, de esta URL a los contenidos. Ahí más o menos, después de unos cuantos pull requests de, de Alberto, hemos estado poniendo al día el tema, así que creo que tenemos más o menos todo. Y no quería enrollarme yo más, quería llamar a José Daniel, que supongo que lo conocemos todos, ¿no? Porque gracias a él tenemos, podemos tener hoy a Piar en el, en el Meetup. So, thank you, thank you so much, José Daniel. Thank you. So uh, I will do it in English. Uh, so I have a few things to say, but the first thing is, as you know, every year we organize our C++ uh, conference in University of Carlos III uh, using STD C++. This year will be on March uh, 7. Uh, the program is already online and you can register. And we have made a major change this year. So usually our, all our talks were in Spanish. This year, uh, most of our talks will be in English. There will be some in Spanish, but most of them will be in English, in part because we will have some international sp speakers, but also in part because we think that for those old people that make talks, that uh, become recorded and go to YouTube, and they do, is, do it as volunteers, it's nice to let them to do in English so that they, they are broadcasted more and they are seen by more people. So these are some of the talks. I will not go into details uh, now, but we have Arno Schodel from Syncell. We have uh, somebody from the QT company. We have Guy Davidson from Creative Assembly, which is a major video games st uh, studio in England, uh, Martin Noblau uh, from Indicen, Axel Nauman from CERN, which is, uh, who is one of the members in the ISO C++ uh, committee, uh, and some, some others. You can uh, go online, and uh, here you, you have the, the web page, and you can see the abstract of every talk. Uh, There are already more than 50 people registered, so be quick and register if you want to come. Uh, so uh, the conference is still free. Last year I said probably we are going to charge something, but fortunately we have sponsors, so I want to thank Indicent for being our gold sponsor and also to Conan and ThinkSell, which are our silver sponsors. And of course, if your company wants to be a sponsor, just talk to me. Uh, but the main thing, and the main reason to be here uh, today is because we have Bjarne Sturstrup uh, this week in Madrid. The reason why he is here is because he's becoming doctor honoris causa. Uh, he gets the honoris causa doctorate by University Carlos III 
This is the highest honor that the university gives uh, to a person, and it's also our way of saying thanks uh, to Bjarne uh, by gi for giving us uh, C++. So thank you very much, Bjarne. Uh, but after today, if you want to get more talks from Bjarne, you can come next Thursday to our university and he will be given, given two talks. You probably got the information, I just insist. In two ways, if you have already registered to any of these conferences and you are not coming, please tell me or cancel your registration. And if you didn't register and you want to come, please register. So there will be one talk in the morning at 12, and there will be another talk in the afternoon at 4 p.m. And I wanted to say something about uh, Bjarne. Of course, if you are here, you know uh, Bjarne, but I cannot resist to say uh, uh, some, uh, some things. So, uh, Bjarne was born in Denmark, in Denmark, where he got a master in mathematics, year 75, and after that he moved to Cambridge, which is the world's oldest co computer science department in the world, where he did his PhD, and by the way, his advisor was the first person in getting a PhD in computer science, David Wheeler. And after that, he joined uh, AT&T Bell Labs, and later he became the head of the large-scale programming department until he moved to Texas A&M University. And after being some years in Texas A&M, he went back to New York City, and today, uh, he works as a director in the technology division of Morgan Stanley, and he is also a visiting professor at Columbia University. Since the very beginning, Bjarne saw the enormous advantages of making C++ a standard language instead of a product of a company or from multiple companies and having dialects. He pushed for making C++ an international standard under ISO. Uh, the process started in 1990, long time ago. And by 1998, we had the first standard, C++ 98, the one we have used uh, for a, a long time. The next major release came in 2011, and by the way, this release was approved here in Madrid, where we, we were able to vote for C++11, and since then, as you know, every three years we have had a new version of the language. As uh, for many other of us, sometimes his proposals are accepted, and sometimes they are rejected, or he is asked for more work, and he does. And nevertheless, you will find him in every standards meeting working very hard to make the, uh, the C++ language a better, la better language for all of you. During his career, he has received many awards. You see some of them. They are, uh, they are only the most recent awards, the Young Scott Legacy Medal, uh, and premium from Franklin Institute, the Computer Pioneer Award from IEEE Computer Society, the Charles Stark Draper Award from US National Academy of Engineering, and the Faraday Medal. Probably they don't say nothing to you, but I will tell you the names of other people who got those awards. Marie Curie, Thomas Edison, Nikola Tesla, Alexander Fleming, John Bacos, Maurice Wilkes, Jack Kilby, Vinton Cerf, Tim Berners-Lee, J.J. Thompson, or Ernest Rutherford. The list continues with many other awards and distinctions during he, his whole career. So it's for me the greatest honor and a pleasure to ask you to give a warm welcome to Professor Bjarne Sturster.
Um, thanks for coming, and I'm not quite sure how to follow up on that talk, but uh, I'll try. Um, I'm going to talk about litter. I don't like litter, garbage, whatever it is. I don't like it. And um, what I'm going to talk about is work in progress. I can't come and say, here's a product you can go and buy, or here's a, a simple set of rules you can follow, and uh, your code will get better. What I do hope is that I can show you some directions that will work. You can start with it now, and it'll take some time to get there. That's the idea. Uh, some of this stuff is experimental. Uh, some of it is conjecture. Uh, but many parts are in, in fairly serious use. And it's not science fiction. I, I love science fiction, but not while I'm working. Um, so, um, let's see. Um, somebody found a version of this a bit uh, sl uh, slow, so I'm going to say you right up front what I want. I want complete type and resource safe C++. Uh, no memory corruption no resource leaks, uh, no garbage collector. If you don't make any garbage, you don't need a collector. And uh, that's, that's important. Uh, no runtimes overhead. Um, I mean, I, I want this to run as fast as C++, um, or faster, um, even though it, we want total safety, uh, resource and type safety. And if you need range checks, yes, you have to pay for them. I'm not saying you have to take them, but if you want full safety, you have to. So uh, that, that, uh, that is a minor cost, which you pay today anyway if you want that kind of safety. Um, no new limits of expressibility. I, I really don't want a language that can only be used for a really nice, uh, well-defined set of problems that we can imagine today. Tomorrow's problems are going to be different. That's one of the few things we want. We, we know. And um, yeah, of course I can make this stuff perfectly safe. Just stop people from doing anything. Um, it's uh, the combination of expressibility, the ability to get something done, and safety that, that I'm after. Um, and I want it to be ISO C++. I've worked a lot of time on C++. I know how hard it is. If you succeed with a, if you fail with a language, it's miserable and hard work. If you succeed, it's even harder. And um, I want the code to be simpler. One of the ways of getting better code and faster code is simply to get simpler and less code. And so I'm not giving that up. It's it's not. I'm not. I don't want to go for bloatware. But I want tools to help me. And that's the weak. Uh, spot in this, see the work in progress. The tools that I want for, um, for, for ensuring this and for guiding people in to use it are still not quite there. Um, th there is support, it's an open source project. Um, you can find it on GitHub. Uh, quite a few people are involved now. Um, there's regular meetings, uh, let's see, Morgan Stanley, Microsoft, Red Hat, Facebook, and if you go and look, you'll see that there are lots and lots of more people involved. Um, I like to point out having people from Red Hat and Microsoft in a sequence of meetings is progress. This, this, this things are happening. And so uh, you can find a lot of the uh, static analysis stuff that I'm talking about in Visual uh, Studio and a little bit is in Clang Tidy. I hope to see more in both cases. Um, I used to say soon, now I've learned better. It takes forever to get it done, but it's improving. Um, and so I want C++ on steroids. There's a lot of people who says type safety and think Java. That's uh, not what I want. It's not flexible enough, it's not fast enough, uh, but I wouldn't mind the safety aspects, and that's what I'm going to get. Um, and I'm going to do it with essentially all of C++. Oh yeah, uh, that by the way, of course, is uh, the, the holy grail. And I would say that this, this is the holy grail of some kinds of, um, of programming. And um, the, the, the measure of what we're doing, what the, the purpose of the exercise with language design and programming is actually to build really important good things. 
and um, I'm, I've written papers on theory, but really I'm into building things, so there, there's a few examples. I, uh, I mentioned I liked uh, science fiction. Um, Douglas Adams made an early video game called the Spaceship Titanic, and I bumped into some of the people that helped him, so I know that Douglas Adams were writing C++. That's cool. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see what else is there. Um, this started with a question I was asking myself and lots of people were asking sort of five years ago or thereabouts, what, what's good modern C++? Or what is good C++ 11, as I used to, um, to ask it? And lots of people were asking that question and the answers were quite diverse and confused. And um, I decided we, we need a, 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 an answer for that. But there's a problem with the adjective modern. People can argue what modern means. And um, so my definition is it's sort of the best you can do now. And so if you want to talk about what modern C++ should be, you have to look ahead. So what would you like your code to look like in five years time? And uh, if, if you answer just like the code I write today, you are assuming you aren't learning anything. That's wrong. We, we, we should do better than that. And uh, that was the question I asked five years ago, and it's the answer question I asked today. It's just the, um, the, the end point has moved. Um, so um, there is a set of rules that I have been writing out, guidelines. So we start by saying, the standard defines what the language is and what the construct means. It doesn't say what's good. It doesn't uh, distinguish um, sort of rubbishy code from, from good code. So the, the project starts with outlining a set of guidelines for what we uh, think uh, distinguishes good code. And to, first of all, to, to say that, you have to sort of have a, a, a philosophical framework for what how, how do you define good? And um, of course, I've been asking this kind of question for years, but, but basically, um, here, here's sort of the foundational thing. They're not different from C++. It may be different from the C++ you hear uh, misdescribed on um, Reddit or something, but this is what I'd like to do. I want to express my ideas in code, not in the comments. I really like to write standard code because I like portable code. And um, I want to express the intent. I really think it's nicer if I can see, if I say what I want done, rather than say in details how I want it done. If I really need to say in details how it's done, fine, I go down one level of abstraction. One of the purpose of interfaces is to hide dirty stuff. And if I have to do something quote, dirty, unquote, uh, to get things to run fast, like to use an architecture that isn't supported well directly, well, I put a really nice interface that expresses intent, that allows the user to express intent, and then I implement it under the, um, uh, un under the hood. And uh, pro ideally, programming should be statically type safe. You look Back in what I was writing in the 90s and 80s, it was always there. This is nothing new. Uh, I like compile time checking, uh, so runtime checking if I can get it, uh, because then I don't have to have the error handler. Um, let's see what uh, can't be checked at compile time should be checkable. There's a lot of people that write code where you can't actually tell what is right. There's some vague comments that says what it's supposed to do. And there's no way I can check that if I'm willing to spend, say, a factor of 10 to run a slow test or something. I can't because I don't know what it is. So you have to be able to check it uh, checkable at compile time. The simplest example here is just range checking. Sometimes we can't afford range checking, but we can always turn it on and check it and then for production uh, run fast. Uh, catch errors early, don't leak any resources. Uh, again, I want my files closed, I want my memory not to run out, I want my locks to be unlocked. Uh, this is very important. I've been 
working with embedded systems and such where uh, leaking a resource is, well, you have a space, uh, uh, some, something lost in out of space and such. We don't want that. Uh, prefer immutable data to immutable data. I've always liked costs. They don't, uh, they don't change. Uh, you can't have a race condition on a constant. And other good stuff like that. Um, encapsulate, as I said before. Don't spread the uh, dirt all around your code base. Encapsulate it, but sometimes you do have to have ugly code. Um, my mathematicians, well, I, 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 have a, I have a math degree, so I can say rude things about mathematicians. They sometimes think that you can get rid of all the dirty stuff. I have never seen that in any real uh, significant code uh, that, that had to be portable. So uh, you have to be able to hide things. Uh, and then I want tools. I lo love uh, tools and I love libraries. If I can get your library that you've tested well instead of writing it myself, that's a great one for me. Um, anyway, so that was philosophy. And you ha have to go down and make things um, practical. Philosophy is great, but I can't write a program to check my philosophy and to check whether your code meets my philosophy. It's, it's just words. And so you have to make it concrete. And you go down a level of abstraction. Here's an example. Uh, resources. I want uh, resources handled automatically. We all know that it's easy enough to get something and it's easy to forget to give them back. It's not just programming. Uh, try your local library to see uh, the, whether this works. Uh, people forget to hand back. That's RAII, constructors, destructors, all of this stuff. Um, then interfaces, uh, we say a raw pointer should denote an individual object only. It's the only safe thing because if you have a pointer and you start subscripting it or doing arithmetic on it, you have no idea where you're going. And so we, we, we want to say if there's a, in the code is a pointer, it points to something, only one thing. Uh, if we want something else, we have to do something else. We have abstractions that we can build for that. Um, so uh, raw pointer is non-owning. That is, if I see a pointer, int star, should I delete it or not? In general code, you don't know. There's nothing there. It's an int star. Where did it come from? We don't know. I want to get that out of the way. We want to have rules so that we can say, well, if it's just a raw pointer, it doesn't actually own it. By owning, I mean you have to delete it. It's, it's yours. It's your responsibility. And raw references are no, non-owning. Um, Scoped objects, I love scoped objects. Uh, don't he heap allocate unless you actually have to. And uh, avoid non-cons global variables. Da -da -da. So there's a lot of this stuff. I'm not going to go through it. You can go on, type in uh, uh, core guidelines into any browser. You'll get to the GitHub. You'll get to uh, the, the longish uh, document. That, that goes into all of these details. And you will, by the way, notice that uh, details missing and you would really like another 50 ro rules or something like that, despite the fact that there's already too much, but you will. Uh, and then, uh, that, well, it's a GitHub, so uh, make a suggestion. You can help. Uh, but I'm not going to go there. This was just the, the warm up uh, to the talk. I'm going to talk about pointer problems and then, um, the, the solution to them, which is a collection of, um, of, of rules, a combination. Okay, so um, let's see here. I actually like pointers. The, I mean, if you want to point to something, there's nothing better in the machine than a pointer. It's just a, just, just a memory ad address, so there's nothing better than that by definition. And um, uh, the, the, the simplest thing to do when you just want to go and look there, you machine know how to go and look there. Um, they're general. Anything you can refer to, you can refer to with a pointer. That's, again, by definition, because that's how you point to things in memory. Um, they are as fast as um, Intel and friends can make them. Um, they are complex. They're as small as you can make them. Well, with bigger memories, they're getting a bit bigger, but... Uh, they, they, for, for what they are, they are the 
this. And C's memory model has served us really well for decades. There's a reason this stuff doesn't go away. And because there's a really good map to hardware. And actually, if you look at it, this kind of stuff, which is C's memory model, a sequence of objects in memory with a first element and one beyond the edge, it's, um, it, it's just extremely useful. And it's an abstraction of what real memory is. So even our hardware is an abstraction. Um, they, they, the, the silicon don't actually execute uh, 386 or whatever instructions. They go through some abstraction levels inside there. So this is a very useful abstraction. I, I point this out because people say, that, well, that's not hardware, that's just hardware. No, 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 Dennis had a really bright idea. He says, well, all the machines look like that, independently of how they do it. So let's just go that way. Um, and pointers are not respectable. So if you, if you look up pointer, you get lots of rude comments. Um, they're dangerous, low level, they are not mathematical, true. And there's a huge uh, anything but pointer crowd. But the alternatives have their own problems. And I like those aspects there. They are really rock solid, um, useful properties. But let's, let's not fool ourselves. Uh, objects can be really messy. And here's sort of a lifetime idea. There's uh, here, uh, whoops. Yeah, there's something that points to something. There's one thing that keeps the track on that. That one, there's two different ones that holds on to it. So if I deleted it, it through that one, this one would point to nothing. Bad stuff. Here, you've got a circle, a reference. It's easy enough to build up. And if you get that, it's hard to get out of the mess. Here's one thing here that nothing is pointing to it. Um, and this one here has something, it's gone, but the pointer is still there. So these are real problems. I mean, people who say the pointers are dangerous are correct. Um, well, knives are dangerous, saws are dangerous, power saws are even more dangerous than ordinary saws and such. So the question is, how do we manage this? But let's get on with it. Ownership can be messy. An object can be, um, be, be on the stack. And that's nice, because then it gets cleared out. It gets created by a constructor. And it, if there's any cleanup that needs to be done, the destructor will do it. That's my model of what's nice. It, um, you make it, and the system cleans it up. And not just cleans it up, it cleans it up as soon as uh, possible because I don't want resource retention. I mean, if I re retain my resources for twice as long, I need twice as big a machine. It's as simple as that. I don't like twice as big a machine because my programs tend to fill it in the first place. Um, I used to do simulations, and one of the rules of simulation was you saturate all your cycles and all of your memory. Uh, so really, yeah, this, is, this is great. And things can be on the heap, of course, and member. And I can make a linked list that goes through all of these. How on earth are you going to manage that? Uh, this, by the way, is one of the things I can't do quite as well as I would like. I'll get to it. This is not a talk about how you have a perfect solution to everything. Uh, but we have solutions to some things. And here, resource management can be even messier because not all of the resources are pointers or memory. There's a thread ID hiding in that object. It keeps that thread alive. Uh, if I don't get the destructor for this one called, this one doesn't get freed, and the system starts running out of threads. Uh, locks are say, same, and you can have locks and multiple references to it. And here's one of my favorite. You put a map key somewhere, and now the object in the hash map will live forever unless you get to this one and destroys whoever owns it. Um, it's, that's one of the good ways of getting a memory leak in a garbage collected system. And uh, yeah, here there was something outside the object holding it, all the usual. This, this is messy. So we're not, we're not arguing that, that this is going to be simple. And pointers, there's a stray pointer. Here's a pointer that points off the end of something. Here's a pointer that points just to the middle of something. So even though that one is on the free store, maybe on the free store, if I use that one to delete it, chaos would erupt. 
So it's all bad. And then there's the null pointer, which is, uh, which is fine. We can deal with that in other ways. So I want to eliminate all the leaks and all the memory corruption. And in principle, that's very easy. Look at KNR1 and Dennis, Dennis Ritchie will tell you how to do it. Every object should be uh, initialized before it's used. And if it's, a, if, if it's been on, on, the, on the free store, uh, malloc and such, you have to delete it exactly once. And that was actually how I got started with C++. I was uh, making sure that uh, this became true for a large number of objects. And I gained credibility by finding bugs in certified telecommunication software by basically um, encapsulating the uh, resources in some little classes with a constructor and destructor. The destructors fired. Somebody said, this is wrong because you've uh, always, and they, I found double, double initializations and things like that. This is pretty fundamental um, and very useful. And uh, if you allocate something with new, it must be deleted. If, it, uh, if you didn't allocate it with new, you must not delete it. You have to have both of these things. And basically, we want to make sure that every access to a pointer uh, does go to a point, goes to some, some object. Like we don't want to, uh, a, a stray point or an uninitialized point or pointers or something that delete your work. So again, there's a set of rules here. Notice I'm going down one level of abstraction from, from what I said before and here. This, this basically follows. If you start looking at what the ideals are and then working out what the, the rules really must be, you get this. And there is lots of solutions to this. These problems are at least 40 years old. I guess I should update this to 50 or something like that, 60 maybe even. Uh, and there are lots of partial solutions. And the, the problem is that all of those solutions work up to a point. I mean, we can ban or seriously restrict pointers, and then you can add uh, indirections everywhere uh, or add checking everywhere. It just costs too much in terms of memory space and memory um, and, and the indirections. You can do manual man uh, memory management, also known, be careful, be really careful. It works unless you have a few thousand lines of code, and most of us uh, ends up dealing with a few million lines of code. So yeah, it, it works, but not at the scale we want it. Uh, garbage collectors, um, if you have a garbage collector, you still have to do manual resource management for anything that isn't a memory. I mean, the, if, if you, if you, rec if you um, recycle the memory that holds your thread handle, you uh, have an, uh, a, a thread that lives forever, that might not be such a good idea. And secondly, uh, yeah, so you can leak uh, the, the example of the, uh, the, 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 you know, the list into the hash table is an example. So it's, it, it costs a lot. Also, if you want a good, efficient garbage collector, you basically need twice as much memory than you ever use because you need a copying garbage collector, and they really like to have twice as much memory. And again, I want to use all the memory for my stuff. I, I like applications. And static analysis, it's really nice. If you could just take a program, run it, and prove that there's no leaks in it, uh, you're one. The problem is that to do that, you have to use algorithms that really doesn't scale to large programs, to realistic programs. They also really don't like um, dynamic uh, linking of any sort. So again, a partial solutions. There are people, in, especially in the embedded systems industry, that can statically analyze this. But their programs are getting larger too, so uh, they have a problem. Smart pointers, you start with counted pointers or something like that, and then you have your whole program filled with um, shared pointers. Uh, I see two problems with that. Uh, one is that sooner or later you get cyclic dependencies and you now need weak pointers and all kinds of, of strange things. Uh, secondly, in a distributed system, it's a little bit hard to know who is sharing stuff. And uh, the other thing is it costs something to update that use count. And most of the things aren't shared. If you looked at it, it's 
most things are not shared. They're, 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 they're owned by one, one entity. And functional programming can eliminate pointers that has other problems uh, such as data. Uh, let's see. So basically, this stuff doesn't scale. Uh, we have been trying it since that was a supercomputer. It's uh, about a hundred of the power and memory of my uh, cell phone. Uh, but um, yeah, it's been, we've been go doing this for a long time. Uh, other constraints on the solution, I really want it now. Uh, I don't want to invent a new language, too much work, and anyway, you will make new mistakes. Uh, and I don't want to wait for a new standard. Even with standards coming every three years, convincing the standards committee to, to do all of this um, would be just about impossible because part of it is not what it does, it's how it should be used. And the standards committee doesn't like that. So it's, it's worse than I can see here. And I want to guarantee, be careful, it's not good enough. And again, this is C++. It is not uh, some slow, beautiful academic language. Okay. Be precise about ownership. Basically, don't litter. Never litter. Um, statically guarantee that anything created with new is deleted and that anything uh, not uh, uh, created with new is not deleted. Uh, eliminate all the dangling pointers. And I want a static guarantee because runtime is just too late. Uh, if, if I determine that runtime, then I have to have all of these uh, exceptions for null pointer exceptions and such, they come too late. They may be necessary in some cases, but, but they, it's much better if it doesn't happen in the first place. And I want to make the resource management implicit. Um, the, the release is to be implicit. Uh, the acquisition is usually um, not implicit. You have to say you want something. And then we can provide explicit tests for null pointer and range checking. And there's other problems that comes in with pointers, casts and such, unions. We can deal with that. So resource leak, we know how to deal with. I mean, that's what we have objects. Uh, all of these uh, well-known classes are uh, basically handles to some resource. Um, they create something, they give you a way of managing it, and they clean them up nicely when they go away. And uh, that, 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 that works nicely. Um, RAII is the beautiful name uh, came out of this. Um, I sometimes say that, I mean, I had a really good idea and I called it resource acquisition is initialization, proves I should not be in marketing. Uh, it's, but but that's, that's what it is, it's a really good idea. And it's, well, since uh, 1979, still the best. So let's go one step. We've done that. So let's go one step further and try and attack the pointers uh, straight on. And uh, so here is some innocent looking code. I get a pointer and I delete it. It looks innocent enough. Uh, here I make a pointer. I use it. it. Looks innocent enough. I do a lot of work here. That's fine. And then I use the pointer. Look just at this, and you don't see any problem. Um, if you look at the whole thing, you'll see a problem, a very bad problem. But in a large quote base, this is one slide. Hide this one in 10,000 lines, 100,000 lines, 10 million lines. Um, it's just about impossible to find. Yes, there's tools that help us, but they, they take time and they're imperfect. So this is my worst nightmare. I had to find uh, something to illustrate it on a slide, and that's the picture of a nightmare. Um, the problem is you can't see it. And so we have to solve this problem, because if, if we don't do it, we can, create, we can break the type system. After all, if I have the pointer to an object and I delete it, you have a pointer to that and use it, somebody else allocates on top of it, it's all kinds of bad things. We, we have to solve this one. If, if, if this one is not solved, the, uh, the, the, the point of safety, the dangling point of problem, we can't do anything else. And we are going to eliminate with a set of rules 
that is uh, a T star is uh, no, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is considered to be a non-owner. And so we can start making more details rules to make sure this is true. But you go up to the philosophy slide and then you go to the next slide about the rules and that that is there. Now it comes into something that can be checked in context. And we have a primitive thing which I'm going to explain about how to say um, that something is an owner. But most importantly, most owners are objects that manages uh, something. So the uh, pointers that represent ownership are inside a resource handle that uh, takes care of the construction destruction. Fine, vector, unique pointer. We don't have to think about it, it just works. And uh, of course, something that holds an owner is an owner. All of this works uh, recursively. And, and by the way, when I talk about pointers, I talk about anything that points. So references are roughly the same. They're just slightly different rules for the use of them. A unique pointer starts getting better because it has the semantics, but it points to something. So if it is into something else, that something else has to, it becomes an owner. It all works recursively. And you have to handle every attempt to escape into a, a scope in, uh, in closing the owner's scope. Now, um, if I return a pointer, uh, better make sure this uh, is not a raw pointer. I can't handle it. I'll show examples. Um, so this is what the static analysis does, and it can do today. It looks at that delete and says, that's a non-pointer, you can't delete it. And down here it says new into Q, no, you can't do that, that's, uh, you just threw away uh, ownership. And where this stuff becomes real, and where this stuff becomes difficult, and where it's incomplete, is it would really be nice if we didn't have to warn you right there but made sure that you, you couldn't come here without a warning. We have to, uh, because a lot of cases, we don't actually let it out. So there, there's some, some engineering that has to be done to make sure that the rules are obeyed, but there's not so many false positives. But actually, um, if, you, if you use Visual Studio, you can get that one. It, it has been doing it for years. Uh, there's a static analysis thing, so you don't have to run it on every compilation, uh, but it, it can be done. It's not too, um, too, too onerous. It doesn't use any, any non-local algorithms, for instance, so that you can actually work on it. This kind of stuff we can do on a million line code. Um, so rules, again, no pointer must outlive the object it points to. That's really fundamental. And then you start talking about where pointers uh, can go so that that rule becomes true. And um, the, the classical way of uh, messing up here uh, is that if you have an integer here and I return a pointer to it, the compiler has been able to catch that one for a couple of decades. This is just an example of the more general and complete rules I'm working on. And uh, here uh, I'm returning a new integer, but I'm throwing away the fact that it's an owner. That is, the caller of this function, if I do this, do not know that um, he, she, it acquired uh, ownership. And so this, this is bad, we have to, uh, no, wait, wait a minute, yeah. It, it's okay to return it because the object lives, but we have forgotten to, uh, that, that it lives, so it, it fails. It, 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 it is okay for lifetime, it is not okay for uh, correct destruction. And here, this one works. This is an important thing that people have uh, not noticed. I got a pointer, and if the system preserves a pointer, the pointer rules, that is the point to something and all of that, then of course this one can be returned. And so this is very important, so I can send up a, a a pointer to a function like stir comp or sort uh, with iterators. The iterator is just an owner. Is they are non-owning pointers, or I don't care what it is. They, they, I'm just giving you something to point at. So there's nothing wrong with sending a pointer to a function that then returns, and it can return that pointer or not. It's not an owner. So this all works. 
Uh, basically, the rule is that you can point to things and an owner, and there must be no pointers uh, below in the stack. And I have very unnaturally let stacks grow upwards. Um, I, I shouldn't do that, but I was trying to illustrate it for people who may not know the, how they tend to be implemented. Uh, but anyway, so if the stack grows this way, a pointer must never sneak down uh, below the, the ownership level. And it may not, uh, and if you consider the s static allocated stuff to live at the very bottom, uh, then, then this is the rule. Okay, so we do that. Um, so how do we manage this? At high level, which is the way we should do it 90, 99% of the time, use an ownership abstraction. Use something that just keeps track of the ownership. Unique pointer, shared pointer, vectors, maps, all of this kind of stuff saves us from thinking about ownership and lifetime. So that works. The problem is that there's also low level stuff, like how do you implement a vector? It tends to have three pointers in it, and we have to make sure this doesn't screw up. And so we uh, have a low level thing um, that, that's pointer. And the, the fir my first idea, a long, long, long time ago, in 2005, I think, um, I tried to build a system based on something where uh, a T, uh, there was an owning T star, and uh, it was another kind of um, smart pointer, and it got really messy. And the killer was, if I am using an abstraction to hold a pointer, it cannot cross an interface uh, to a C function. And there's a lot of C functions out there. There's a lot of um, C++ that has C style uh, interfaces, sort of two pointers, or a pointer and a size, and all of this kind of stuff. It, it just didn't work. So what we have instead is a pointer, a GSL owner, owner that is an ownership type, but it's an alias. So to the compiler, an owner, this low-level kind of owner, GSL owner, is just owner of T is a T star, uh, owner of T star is a T star. So it can pass interfaces, and if you pass it through the interface on your head, be it. But most of the time, we don't actually pass owners around, so it wouldn't be too bad. And a static analyzer can now enforce the rules here without getting into the mess of the compiler. Uh, GSL is the guideline support library. It's a very small library, I think about 10 abstractions, which we are basically trying to put out of business by getting the fundamental abstractions absorbed into the standard library. And so we, we, we don't actually want to build a system that you should use and uh, we, we, can, uh, we can sell and get rich with or something like that. We, we want to go out of business as fast as possible, we being the uh, people building the guidelines. Okay, and uh, so owner is to simplify static analysis and that's all it does. And so the way you use it is here is a vector. It usually has an owner pointer that points to the element, and then it has two uh, pointers that shows the end of the initialized elements and the end of the allocation. So there's a good example, that's an owner, and it's under the rule for ownership. So if I write the destructor uh, and forget to delete this one, tough, you, uh, it won't pass static analysis. If I try to delete this one in the, in the destructor, uh, tough, you can't do it. So basically we can handle the um, the, the lower level manipulation of ownership and lifetime, um, that's necessary. We can't just lift the le level up, we would lose uh, a lot, uh, especially in embedded systems and such. Okay, um, owner of T. Uh, it's, it helps us here for a, uh, ABI stability. That owner of int star is seen by the compiler, uh, sorry, owner of T star, is, is um, seen by the compiler as a T star, and therefore there's been no change. The ABI that was defined for C 20 years ago or something like that still works. That's important. 
On the other hand, when we write our code, here's an f of owner of int star. I can call foo with that. That's an owner. That's the, we know that. We try a non-owner. Uh, no, wait a minute. I'm trying to transfer ownership here. Um, and this one here, it's not an owner and can't suddenly become an owner up there. You can delete this one that's an owner. Yep, you must delete it. If I forgot that line, this wouldn't compile. Well, sorry, it wouldn't pass the static analyzer. Q2, delete it. No, it can't do it. So th there's, even if I get it wrong, the rules just follow from basic logic and uh, we, it works. Um, and so basically what we have here is we, 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 we're using all the old techniques, but only parts of them in combination. The basic idea is you know how they, they did in medicine and a lot of illnesses, they, they survive or mutate out of one uh, medicine. And they, if you try different medicines and it happens again and again, it cannot kill the disease. If you give them a dose of three things at the same time, um, the bugs uh, die. And that's the, that's the basic idea here. So we have a set of rules for saying, well, no, no, we cannot guarantee every legal program. We will deem some of the programs good by saying they follow a set of rules. Then we'll give support libraries so that you actually start at a reasonable high level and you don't have to mess with all the low level stuff. The guidelines that, that wants to tell you exactly how to use every single feature in C or C++ gets very, very complicated and basically unmanageable. And finally, the type system is your best friend, the compiler is your best friend. If you litter your code with casts, um, this stuff stop working. So one of the rules is don't use casts. Um, all the rules have caveats and explanations and what you do instead and things like that. But I, I helped write, uh, wrote most of the guys, uh, guidelines for the flight software for the, um, for, for, the, for the Lockheed Martin fighters. And there's a rule that says, if you want to use a cast, you need your supervisor's signature. The basically, it strongly encourage people to use alternative solutions. And then you provide the libraries to make the alternative solutions pleasant. But I, I, I hate casts, they, they, they stop. They stopped me from thinking straight. Um, okay, none of these uh, techniques are sufficient by themselves, but they can help, and so we combine them. And uh, now, we have the ideas, and there's a quote by uh, Thomas Edison, uh, invention is 1% inspiration and 99% sweat. And um, so we are working on the details, and. It is really hard. Be comprehensive, minimize false positives, make sure it works for real programs, not just for test cases. Um, so allow for gradual adoption. Nobody can take a, well, well, so we want to make it work for million line programs. Nobody can take a million line program and just do it all in a day or before the next bug needs to be shipped. So it, you, you have to have gradual adoption. This is a fairly practical uh, exercise and a coherent uh, tool set on all platforms. I, I like portability. This is currently not true. Uh, there's coherent, but it's not complete and it's certainly not on all platforms. Um, my bank, bank is mostly a GCC shop and uh, this stuff works best on Windows. Um, that's unfortunate for for us, but we'll get there one of these days. And uh, you can't just, this is, this is the idea that if you let people uh, do their basic stuff, it sort of, um, it doesn't take into all of, it doesn't take everything into account. Uh, think of this as an argument for coherent, so how to be coherent. Um, static is not quite as flexible as dynamic. There's a couple of problems you run into. Uh, the thing is here, I have, um, I, I have a nice little vin vector of integers and I'm sticking four uh, pointers to integers in it. That's a pointer to integers, it's fine. That's a pointer to an integer, it's local, it's fine. That's a pointer to something on the free store, that's fine. That's pointer to the global up there. This is fine. 
this is all fine. And I can pass that vector to functions that return, it's all fine. The minute I try to send this one out, I have a big problem. Because some of the, these pointers may exit and some of them cannot. Currently, I believe we simply don't allow that because we don't. I mean, every year or two, I come up with a design that requires this kind of mixed scope uh, set of pointers, but, but you really have to make sure they don't escape. And so that's part of the rules. We're getting to the, to the details here. Um, the other thing we have here is uh, this one is also wrong because of ownership concerns. Um, if I put them into a vector, the, uh, the vector uh, doesn't, isn't an ownership, but if I'd had a vector that owned this, it would also be wrong, right? We have to, can't be mixed for scope and they can't be mixed with ownership category. Those are the two things we do all the time. Who owns it uh, and uh, does it point to something? That's fine. This is just to point out that there are limits to this. When I write these things, I usually have a big bit vector sitting on the side saying, um, okay, which one are you actually supposed to delete later? Or something like that. Uh, ownership of pointers. I, I like owner, owners. They, they, they are fundamentally a tree, except for shared pointers. And uh, you can deal with invalidation. The research level problem is, how do you represent a safe, general, and efficient graph? If you have a general graph, this a nice tree of ownership very easily get corrupted. I mean, you can make very nice uh, abstractions that has a vector of pointers to anything that's in it on the side, and then you can do arbitrary things uh, to it. And, but then there's people that write graphs where the owners are outside and such. It's, this is, if, if I can solve this problem, and it's still a problem, then, then I think we, we, we can uh, claim to have a handle on the generality of expression uh, problem. We mustn't come up with a set of rules that can only be done by throwing away the best solution to some problem. And this is my uh, attempt to characterize the best problem. I reckon that all the problems I've ever seen of the really, really hard ones with ownership and guaranteed uh, pointer access comes up in general graphs. They have cyclic references, so don't think uh, garbage collection will help you. Um, they, they, they are far too complicated for static analysis. If you put it in smart pointers, which has also been done, it just costs more than if you don't do it. And uh, so this, this, this is a hard problem. If anybody uh, has ideas here, I would like to hear about them. Okay, um, concurrency used to be a problem. Um, turns out that a lot of the problems goes away if you can treat a thread as a pointer. So any pointer that goes over to the other thread is like a thing you put into a container. Now you just have to determine the lifetime of the thread and there are roughly two uh, lifetimes. Uh, there's a thread we have in the standard where we actually don't know anything about the lifetime of that thread. It, it, it may be detached and it may not and we don't know it. So one of the things is that we recommend that people use uh, joining threads. That's a thread in the GSL that's called a joining thread. And that means that the scope uh, then you can treat it as a local container, just like the vector of pointers in the other slide, because at the bottom of the scope, at the bottom of the function, it will be treated like a, a vector, a container. Its uh, the structures will be fired. And otherwise, you can make it an uh, eternal um, a thread, a detached thread, and then nothing will get deleted. And you know that. And so the analysis can handle those two cases. Personally, I seriously dislike um, th threads that live forever. I really want the handle to them somewhere because otherwise I don't even know if they are alive. If you detach a thread, how do you know that it's still running, like a heartbeat? It would be really nice to know if the heartbeat is still working. And uh, for that, I need some kind of handle on it. 
So I, I, I find that a lot of the problems that we expected with um, concurrency uh, went away. Uh, just treat them as a container, and if it's a joining thread, it's a local, con uh, it's a local object. Uh, by the way, uh, we are going for J-thread or some similarly named things in the standard. If the vote goes right in uh, Kona about a month from now, uh, we can scratch. Um, we, we can scratch the uh, JSO um, um, uh, thread because the standard will have provided a facility for, for doing it. So we are seriously trying to get ourselves out of the library business, even though libraries are essential. Because if we can get it into the standard, we don't have to be there. Um, here's a here's a hard one: owner invalidation. I make a pointer. I delete it and then I use it. Okay, at this point, that pointer was uh, invalidated and the static analysis has to know that it's not really a pointer here anymore. You mustn't use it. I mean, there's things you can do with it, like uh, assign something new to it and such, but basically you, you mustn't use what's pointed to at this point. That's easy. This one is uh, somewhat less easy. Um, you have a vector of v and you pass the v over to a thread, then you push back on this vector uh, which invalidates this one over in the other thread. Um, this mustn't happen. So you have to detect all the cases where you have, where you, you do something like a pushback or an invalidation and then you um, go there. Um, this, I believe, is not done in all cases in the current static analysis. But uh, I believe it can. Oh yeah, I say it can, so I have looked at this carefully. Um, yes. Uh, why not use uh, smart pointers? As I said that. It's more complex, it's more expensive. A unique pointer is, is a good cheap pointer. Uh, there's no added data. I don't like more memory to be used, uh, and it guarantees deletion. That's good. Uh, shared pointer is seriously overused because it it became cool after um, after '98 and even before, and people didn't quite understand that if they have shared pointers, they are bigger. So if you copy them around, it's more expensive to copy. Uh, or and there's a use count, and the use count for a shared pointer. For the typical shared pointer, the use can't go 0 to 1, 1 to 2, 2 to 1, 0. 0, 1, 2, 1, 0. You do that a million times, or a billion times, and you start costing things. Because most of our code are in shared, in, in places with, um, with threads. They, they're in concurrent programs. Which means that we have to synchronize to access the use count. And therefore, passing a shared pointer is much more expensive than to pay, uh, pass a pointer or a unique pointer. So uh, we have to, they, there, there are places it can be used to. I mean, really things like you have a set of threads and the first one that uh, gets the answer, no, sort of the last one to finish uh, cleans out the data structure. That kind of problem cannot be solved without some kind of use counting. So you need them, but they're just, they've been overused a lot. And, and they cost more than most people think. Another inclin inclination that there's something wrong is that I see a fair amount of code where people use pointers to share pointers. There's nothing inherently wrong in this. I like ordinary pointers, they can be passed to functions and passed back again. But if that's not all you're doing, you just wasted your shared pointer because you don't know how many places those references to the object. Okay, so fine. This is sort of the slide that shows it's not uh, science fiction here. Um, I have a, uh, this is a test, test case, of course. Um, what am I, ha I have a structure S2 with two pointers to integers in it, that's fine. I make uh, one of those objects here, 
uh, I put in p and I put in a new integer and then I try to return it and that mustn't happen. This is an earlier version, it doesn't allow it to be created. Um, that was sort of one of the examples I said. These can become arbitrarily complex and we're actually getting pretty good at catching them. Um, that was from Visual Studio. And so there's a summary, never let a pointer escape from where it can refer to its object. Um, after that object is destroyed, um, I have to formulate that better, that sounds waffly. Um, it's not just pointers, it's anything that can, can hold, keep something alive, um, like a, a, um, a, a link in a link. Thinking of hash table entries. And uh, we need to do a formal proof. We'll never convince the academic that this stuff works. So we can write it down in the equations and, and prove that it's complete. Um, we have people working on this that, that could do that stuff. There has been a start done by uh, Gabidos Reyes and uh, uh, some of the people uh, associated with Koch, uh, jean Roura and such for the C++, but not for this. But we're pretty sure it can be done, but it'll take years, and, and we're busy with other things. And we need to demonstrate uh, scaling. We have done a few things at uh, sort of the million line level with static analysis, finding things. I mean, this stuff here um, is simple, but just about any, this is a whole series of examples of me trying to uh, break the, uh, the static analyzer. And essentially all of this works on million line programs, even with million line programs that has too much C, st C style code in it. And uh, then there's other problems. And uh, my view there is that this is, a, this is a less bad problem. I can see it. Uh, it's not my nightmare, it's just I don't want them in my code. So you want to deprive bugs of their environment. I mean, make sure they have no place to live. We know where bugs hide, in messy code, complicated code and such. So we want to get rid of it. Um, for unions, use variant. There used to be a GSL variant, but uh, only, we, I don't think we ever advertised it existed because the STD variant was coming. Um, cast, just don't do them. Uh, you can use them inside abstractions. We can, I think we can make rules that make sure that the, the bad stuff from a, uh, from a cast doesn't escape uh, out from uh, a scope. So it's good. Um, there's a, a span abstraction, which I'll mention, but basically that's a pointer with the size that's attached. We use that for to, to deal with things that like that I like, uh, arrays and uh, or try and catch misuses of smart pointers. Just taste everything is not a good answer. Uh, there's span. Um, here is a sort of a classic way of misusing C or C++. You have an integer, sorry, pointer and a size. We have tons of code like that. And this is fairly regularly found uh, bugs in it. And the bug is one of these things here. I'm assigning to the seventh element. How do I know this is true? Well, I don't. Okay, so let's test. We only use zero to n. Is that okay? I mean, that depends. First of all, is that really a count? Has some bozo defined it to be uh, to be tested with with uh, less than or equal, uh, or um, did somebody give it give the wrong size? These things happen. Now here with a span, there's a span. It it knows it points to some integers, and inside the span we have span we have stored the uh, size. So I can now test this one. Um, it's checkable against uh, the size. So there's an answer. Um, whether we want to exercise this is another matter. But by default, we actually exercise this one. Um, so uh, 
this was this rule that says, if you can't statically prove things, at least make it possible to test it. And here, we can write a range loop. And I don't have to mention the size. I can't get the size wrong. Because it's, it's never mentioned, I can't mess with the loop variables or any of the other bad things. And here, it's actually easier to write. Here's the way we write the traditional style here. For a of 1,000, we give it 100, we give it 100. There, I had a typo, um, like the disaster. Over here, we can just say, give me the span for array. Uh, it knows the size, the compiler knows the size of uh, the array there, so when it builds it in, it's fine. And I can now call it, I don't have to mention size. And here, we can actually give the size explicitly. That's usually done to narrow an uh, 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 array, to give a subarray. Um, and this at least stands out where you can see it. Uh, I can't prove that you, did, that you got a ro thing wrong here. A, a good analyzer could, and even a moderately competent programmer can spot this one. So basically, make simple things simple. And uh, if you can get an alternative that's simpler and just as fast and just as general as the original, then, then you're on the right track. Uh, null pointers, we have a, uh, a way of dealing with this. Oh, yeah. Um, I tried to find a picture to illustrate um, null pointer exceptions. And it turned out that the first three pages were Java sort of slightly rude not to pick a C++ example, but the first three pages, you can try it yourself. Uh, so basically what we have is a non-null non uh, thing here. Basically, it's, it tests when you construct the object whether uh, you're not null. And now, if I pass at not null, I don't actually have to test for null inside it because in the construction of that P, uh, was the null and test. So you move, um, the, move the testing over to the creation of the null and pointer object, and you can then have all of your functions uh, rely on that rather than having every function check that. Um, so basically, we want type and uh, resource safety. The fundamental mechanism there is the constructor destructor uh, pairs, and then we have to go hunting for. Uh, dangling pointers, uh, no leaks. If we can track ownership and use RAII, it goes away. Go for the range errors. The hardest problem with range errors is the invalidation, the pushback on a vector or something like that, and then uh, eliminate null pointer references. And once that's done, we can start looking at other things. Like, we, we can look at the bug uh, records of various large organizations and see what bugs people really make and then try and conclude that certain kind of code should probably be written in another way. And that's where we're going in the future. Maintenance hazards, verbosity, I hate co big complicated code. So you could actually eventually go and look and say this code is just too complicated. Uh, and I'm not me meaning cyclomatic uh, complexity, I'm meaning work backwards from where the bugs were in the bug uh, databases. And it's not unambitious here. Uh, th th there's nothing, there's no deep things here. I mean, I didn't show a single equation, but it's not unambitious. And uh, there's certainly rough seas ahead because, well, it'll take a long time and some people won't believe it's possible and uh, da 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 da. We can do, I think we can do it at scale. Thank you.